what do you like? Tell me what you like. There's value in that because it almost gives the brain like a vacation, right? Holistic health is completely underappreciated, but so critical. Eating whole foods and the key is just to find something that you really enjoy. Welcome to the NAMP Nourishing You podcast. I'm Kristen Burkett. And I'm Diana Wally. We're your hosts for NAMP's podcast dedicated to connecting holistic health enthusiasts with each other to share practical information from the holistic wellness space for enhanced vitality. Diana and I are master nutrition therapists, board certified in holistic nutrition with private practices and an online joint venture that supports clients and practitioners as they strive to reach their full potential. We're honored to be hosting this podcast for NAMP and connecting our listeners with the latest in holistic wellness. If you enjoyed today's show, help us out by commenting below, liking this video and subscribing to the channel to help us spread the word. This episode of the Nourishing You podcast is brought to you by NANP Platinum Sponsor, Holistic Consulting. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Nourishing You podcast. We're thrilled today to bring the renowned Dr. Tori Hudson to talk with us about a very overlooked but debilitating condition, migraines. Dr. Tori Hudson, naturopathic physician, graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in 1984 and has served the college in several capacities, including medical director, associate academic dean, and academic dean. She is currently a clinical adjunct professor at NUNM, as well as at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine, Bastyr University, and the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. Dr. Hudson has been in practice for more than 39 years, is the medical director of her clinic, A Woman's Time, in Portland, Oregon, co-owner and director of product research and education for Vitanica, and the program director for the Institute of Women's Health and Integrative Medicine. She's also the founder and co-director of NERC, the Naturopathic Education and Research Consortium, a nonprofit organization for accredited naturopathic residencies. Dr. Hudson has been appointed as a faculty member of the Fellowship in Integrative Health and Medicine at the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. Dr. Hudson was awarded the 1990 President's Award from the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians for her research in women's health, the 1999 prestigious Naturopathic Physician of the Year Award, the 2003 NUNM Alumni Pioneer Award, the 2009 Natural Products Association Pioneer Award, and in 2012 was inducted into the NUNM Hall of Fame. In 2016, she was the recipient of the annual Oregon Association of Naturopathic Physicians Living Legends Award. In 2021, she received the 2020 American Botanical Council's prestigious Freddie Cronenberg Excellence in Research and Education in Botanicals and Women's Health Award. She's a nationally recognized author, speaker, educator, researcher, and clinician. Dr. Hudson serves on several editorial boards, advisory panels, and as a consultant to the natural products industry. She also writes monthly columns and freelance articles for several publications. Welcome, Dr. Hudson. We're not quite sure how you fit this into your schedule, but we are truly honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much. I think you're the first person that's ever read that bio and didn't make one single <laughs> mistake in pronunciation of something. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. <clears throat> Glad to be here. I mean, your, your, your intro and what you guys are up to is so spiffy and modern and techy. looks really good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. There's a reason why Kristen reads the intro. She is a pro. <laughs> I, I, I think you should get an award for that, Kristen, that amazing intro. I'll take it. It may be the only one I ever get. So. <laughs> well, I think this is our first Hall of Famer on the pod, Kristen, which is super cool. Um, yes. Dr. Hudson, we feel so fortunate to have the opportunity to talk with you. You have been and continue to be a trailblazer in natural medicine, and this field would not be what it is today without you. So thank you oh. so much for that. Ah, oh, that's super sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Very kind. You've been doing this work for decades and have accomplished so much. So I'm curious, what inspired you to pursue a career in natural medicine? And which areas within natural medicine are you currently most passionate about? 
you know, it, it's it's not the easiest thing to go back and track, you know, what led to what led to what led to what. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I was born in 52. I graduated from high school in 1970. So I, uh, I'll come back to the meaning of that in a moment. But just I was uh, one of these kids that was uh, an athlete. I was very much a big athlete and nationally competitive athlete. And so there was always an attention to the body and, you know, how to eat well and live well in terms of, you know, having optimal performance. So I think it started with that, but uh, I know it started with that. And, um, and I, the 1970 thing hap is meaningful because if you look at the seventies, there was just sort of this convergence, I would say of, um, the self-help movement in women's health care, um, the sort of back to the land movement, sus subsistence farming, subsistence living. There was uh, the feminist movement in general. There was, uh, what else? Uh, I don't know that I would say the some emergence of natural medicine during that time, but, but just those things. Oh, and it was, I think the first earth day was in 1970. So all those things really, for me, converged into this influence of natural living, natural choices, healthy lifestyle, natural medicine. And, and so that's beautiful. And um, you were obviously on the forefront. What are you most passionate about in the field now? I know we're going to talk about migraines today. Is that is that um, an area of, of interest? And what else? Well, I mean, really, it's the big bubble is women's health. And that's what I'm passionate about. But women's health is a big bucket. And women, sometimes practitioners think, oh, that just means women only issues, you know, whether that's PMS or menopause or breast related issues or menstrual cramps or, you know, you name it, something that's women only. But actually the definition of women's health includes those things that occur in women only, but it also includes things that occur more often in women, which is a very long list, including mm -hmm. migraines. And then the third aspect of women's health definition is really things, conditions that have some unique uh, characteristic or manifestation or diagnostic consideration in women. And cardiovascular disease is often the one that you can really talk a lot about there um, in terms of nuances between women and men. Uh, so those three things, you know, women's health is you know, a quite broad, uh, I would say the bulk of my clinical practice is not the, all of it, but the majority of it is sort of women like 40 to 70. Um, but younger and older happen too, but that's kind of a, definitely a big chunk. And, um, so there's definitely perimenopause menopause is in the mix uh, of that, but, you know, women, whether they have, whether they're just coming in for hot flashes or not, you know, most people have other things, you know, whether it's their blood pressure or their mood or, or their frequent bladder infections or their headaches or their fibromyalgia or their, you know, you name it, we are a complete package and, and we have likely more than one thing going on at one time and things intersect. Uh, as well. And, and migraines is a good example of that in terms of what are some times in life when things kind of perk up or die down related to our sort of hormonal status. We are so grateful that you had the passion for the field of women's health because, you know, as we look at traditional research, a lot of studies, especially, you know, prior to recent times have not been, have not included women even in the research to get to how they define right. conditions and, and that type of thing. So we're very grateful to you for that. And I can tell you yeah. my, my professional training and continuing education uh, is owes you a lot and a lot of gratitude and my library can speak for that. <laughs> There's a lot back there that has your name on <laughs> thank it. So you. thank you for those contributions as we- Well, you know, uh, you mentioned a really important thing that uh, most all the pharmaceuticals on the market have not 
been studied at all or very inadequately in women. And and we could and unfortunately say that about botanicals and nutraceuticals as well, that there's, if you have a botanical or nutraceutical uh, studied for, let's say, lowering cholesterol levels, chances are those studies are more men than women. Um, but there, there certainly are studies that are just women for in the obvious conditions. But yeah, the medications, I think we have a long ways to go to understand. And it, sort of drug by drug, they kind of discovered, oh, that's a little bit different in women. You know, mm -hmm. like Ambien was kind of the one that comes to mind. Like, oh yeah, Ambi 10 milligrams, women shouldn't take 10 milligrams. They should only take five milligrams if they have to take it at all. Yeah. So yes, differences in women and men in, in diagnostic, not just in the medical condition, but in the clinical evaluation and the diagnostic tests, in the knowledge that the practitioners have. Um, and again, cardiology is kind of a sore spot that, uh, in terms of how um, the 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 inf the deficiency of accurate diagnosis done in women versus men or it comes much later in the game in women than in men right and so many reasons we could do a whole show just on that so maybe well maybe we'll we put could a, we don't have to for, eat that drum <laughs> too much show. yeah but i would sure love to at some point yeah. um well okay so as we turn our attention to our topic today you know it's kind of unsettling to learn that the world health organization places migraine as one of the 10 most debilitating medical illnesses on earth. Um, recent statistics from the American Migraine Society indicate migraine in impacts over 37 million people in the United States. That's one member in every four households and 148 yeah. million worldwide suffer from a chronic migraine. This is staggering. And we really don't hear much about it. Like there's, you know, I listen, I'm a podcast junkie that people just don't <laughs> talk about it. And I don't know if it's because it's a, you know, a complex topic. So it's just really difficult to even address in like, a, you know, a single setting or that type of thing. But we're glad that we're going to talk about it today and at least begin to break it down a little bit. So can sure. you begin by defining migraines for us? How do we know it's a migraine? What's different than a common headache and some of those major symptoms? Well, it's less about the symptoms these days. Uh, it's um, I mean, there are uh, cluster headaches. There are your know, your sort of non migraine headache. I mean, the tip the classic scenario is one sided, throbbing, pulsating, um, not necessarily with an aura, but some can come with auras. So those are kind of some a classic description that can occur. But I think for women, oh, and sometimes. Um, you know, there could be come with nausea or vomiting or extreme sensitivity to light and sound. So those are, that's kind of a typical migraine des description. But then for women, there are what are called menstrual migraines and they're what are called true menstrual migraines. So a menstrual related migraine are attacks that happen re in some, uh, anytime, maybe a few days before the cycle starts or through and through and or through the first three days of menses and or sort of right at the end or at ovulation. But they also happen at other times. So there is these hormonal times that they happen and at other times. So those are menstrual related migraines. But there's something called pure menstrual migraines, which is about uh, um which is specifically they only have, and it doesn't have to do with aura or not. It can be with or without an aura. But a pure menstrual migraine develops exclusively during that, you might say, perimenstrual period, you know, a few days before and or at the beginning and or uh, so at the end of, of menses. And that all has to do with sort of rising. Well, it doesn't all have to do, but the main influence here in the timing is that rise and fall of estrogen in particular. Um, so I hope I answered your question. I think so. So, so I think what you're saying is most all migraines have some hormonal aspect to them, whether or not it's confined to the menstrual cycle or not. So is that why in menopause or after we're done cycling, 
migraines tend to trail off a little bit and they're not as frequent or, or there are other reasons why we might have them. So let me just clarify. So the menstrual related, but not pure are during those hormonal times of the cycle and other times. And then the pure menstrual migraines are just perimenstrual. So in perimenopause, uh, yes, they get more rocky because this up and down is more erratic and that influences many mechanisms in the brain, not just vascular stability, but many mechanisms, which we can talk about if we want to. Uh, but then in postmenopause, when now the estrogen should be like that, um, yeah, uh, migraines tend to go away. Um, and the other times when there are hormonally influenced migraines is during pregnancy and postpartum. Now, pregnancy, they tend to go away. They tend to improve. Let me should, maybe I should say that. Although if you have migraines with auras, they can increase a bit, especially during that first part of the first trimester. But most of the time, migraines tend to improve in frequency, intensity, and duration over the course of the pregnancy. And in some cases, they go away completely. Um, but in those women who have migraines through their pregnancy, even into the end, you know, the last trimester, they will uh, sorry, I should say, if they continue to have migraines in their first trimester, they will tend to have migraines throughout their whole pregnancy. Uh, and then postpartum, again, that big changes in, in estrogen status, that can be a time when their migraines can pick up. So I'm curious. So we talked about, you know, big hormonal shifts, obviously, perimenopause um, and then pregnancy. What about the onset of puberty? in young girls. Is that a time that we see migraine? Uh, yes, because they're starting to have their menstrual cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and, and there are these other triggers. It's not just hormonal changes. So if you have hormonal changes, you know, plus you're stressed out or hormonal changes, plus uh, you're super sensitive to some trigger like uh, a food, for example, or you're um, in some hormonal change, but some some other trigger, light, flashing light, you know, all the triggers that we might think of, um, those can just lower our threshold of tolerance. So you have the hormonal changes plus the trigger, then we're going to get headaches triggers here rather than just up up here the more triggers it you know maybe some people can handle more triggers some people can only handle one um but yeah first often often the the first migraine does occur during adolescence and girls you're right and they tend to peak during during the, the 30s that's when they kind of tend to peak uh and then tend to kind of gradually lessen but again this sort of maybe uptick in perimenopause uh, and, and I have patients that they've never really had migraines before. And now all of a sudden they have these migraines and perimenopause. And, and amidst the treatments, herbs or vitamins or food avoidance or other things, uh, estrogen therapy can be helpful in stabilizing some of this chemistry that's involved in the brain. And I'm wondering, because perimenopause can be just a, a, a very stressful time for many women, oftentimes you're dealing with children in the household, you might be dealing with aging parents, maybe right. that's when your career is blossoming. So you have, as, as you said, you're sort of stacking those, the stress. Yeah, that's a good word. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great word. You're stacking sleep changes can happen with stress, but they also happen in perimenopause. And menopause again, hormonal changes affecting the sleep cycle. Um, so sleep changes, uh, alcohol, caffeine, uh, certain medication, weather conditions. Some people are very sensitive to weather weather conditions. Um, and we mentioned foods. And then there's food additives. Some people aspartame, MSG. That's a trigger for some folks. Do you have any thoughts on connections between histamine and migraines? Do you see? Yeah, actually, his, you're right uh, to bring that up. There are 
<clears throat> there are regulating histamine can be a strategy um i in terms of prophylaxis you know not acute treatment i would say but in terms of prophylaxis or reducing you know the risk the the frequency and duration and that actually comes into play in terms of one of the natural agents vitamin b6 or pyridoxine so b6 has been shown to relieve histamine headaches and it does that by presumably increasing something called diamine oxidase activity mm -hmm. and that diamine oxidase breaks down histamine uh, in the small intestine before the uh, it gets absorbed into circulation. So people that are sensitive to histamines have about half as much diamine oxidase. And women in particular seem to have lower levels of diamine oxidase and therefore higher incidence of migraines. So red wine would be a classic example that women who are unable to tolerate red wine, that might be all about the histamine. Um, and um, one of the interesting things about pregnancy, again, is that during pregnancy, the level of diamine oxidase increases about 500 times. So we uh -huh. break down the histamine during that time much better. Um, so B6 is required, uh, is involved in this whole histamine story. And that is one of the most important, I would say, prophylaxis um, supplements. Um, but I would say specifically if you think the person is having a food trigger. Yeah. Well, isn't there's kind of a um, double-sided thing where as your estrogen levels increase and maybe are increasing out of balance, we get increases in histamine and increased histamine kind of feeds that estrogen train as well. Do you see that? Well, in perimenopause, there are these, it's called a loop cycle. There are these moments where you have a, a greater spike in estrogen than you have in your normal cycle post ovulation. So there are these more erratic spikes and sometimes a little higher. But estrogen as a therapy, especially in the form of a patch, is very regulating to numerous mechanisms in the migraine chemistry uh, of it all. And so an estrogen patch stabilizes not only the vasculature, but it helps stabilize it. serotonin receptors and platelet aggregation, and I, possibly histamine release as well, uh, reducing inflammatory eicosanides, certain numerous mechanisms, estrogen, that, that constant estrogen patch trying to trying to take out the highs and the lows uh, is a very therapeutic tool. I realize that's not a nutritional agent, um, but it's an important agent, especially in women who have these classic, if they, if their onset of migraines is in perimenopause or they're worse in perimenopause or they're killer migraines a couple days before their menses or the first day or two of their menses that estrogen patch we apply about a week before and it really 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 decreases again the frequency and severity this episode of the nourishing you podcast is brought to you by nanp platinum sponsor holistic consulting holistic consulting is a 12-month cohort-based online program for those working towards becoming board certified through the NANP or those seeking continued nutrition education and guidance on starting a business. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great pearl right there because I'm thinking a lot of women probably don't um, think about that, you know, think about maybe some hormone replacement um, with estrogen. So that's a really great pearl. Yeah, I learned no. that from a, neuro a neurologist, actually, a headache specialist neurologist many, many years ago. And it served me well when diet, lifestyle, stress management, riboflavin, butter burr, magnesium, 5-HTB, all that doesn't work or doesn't work well enough. And then you bring on the estrogen patch and, and for, I mean, it's it can be a real game changer. So it sounds like since the hormone imbalance or fluctuations um, are kind of at the root of, of the migraine issue, what are some of, before you go to the estrogen patch, maybe we can dive into some of yeah. those more um, 
lifestyle yeah. diet things that can be helpful that, you know, yep. we can try on our own before we start heading to the doctor. Yes, for. absolutely. We kind of jumped ahead of the game there. Yeah. That's well, okay. I, th I think a practitioner uh, is, it's always good to look for triggers um, that are obvious, you know, and, and, and the, patient themselves is is often a good self-reporter about that um when it's not obvious you could employ certain techniques like a food sensitivity test of some kind although i feel like i wish it would be more rewarding than it has been <laughs> over the years um and then like i said just like what's her level of alcohol intake uh what's her level of caffeine and often women themselves know, they know, oh, I drink a glass of wine and I get a migraine. So, but if she's drinking one or two glasses every night and she's getting pretty frequent migraines, it might not be a real clear cause and effect to her. But to us, we should recognize that. Um, aged cheeses is another kind of suspect. Um, also, I think just skipping meals again. I don't want to oversimplify. It's just a low blood sugar thing, but 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 blood sugar stabilization can be part of the story. Um, but it's it's very complex. Like I said, we used to in terms of what goes on in here in the migraine brain. We used to science used to think it was just a vascular instability thing, constriction, vasodilation, depending on the phase of the migraine headache that you're in that moment but there are there's there's drops in magnesium levels that might be pertinent for some people there's uh there's these uh serotonin receptors or that's why these drug these triptan drugs work is because these glitches with serotonin receptors and targeting them um, there are, I mentioned these inf this in cascade of inflammatory substances that are being released. Platelets are sticking together. Um, there, what else can I think of? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Noradrenaline, other neuropeptides like substance P. There are, the brain re is responding to changes and glitches in, in one or more of these areas. So the more... I think migraines is a good situation to not just target one diet, one food, one vitamin, one herb, because it's a multifactorial, multi-chemistry phenomenon. And so I think the more agents that target the more mechanisms, the better. And that's what I have found over the years. I'm not just going to use magnesium. I'm not just going to use riboflavin because that they only target maybe one or two mechanisms and I need to target about, you know, half a dozen or more. So uh, I need the ginger, I need the CoQ10, I need the riboflavin, I need the butter but to, to cobble together to really scaffold around more mechanisms being addressed. You know, I think you just hit on something that's really big that I, I want our audience to make sure they clue into because I hear this from so many people that have migraines. And I, I mean, I feel very fortunate. I don't have migraines myself. I have a lot of empathy for those that do, but they'll say, well, I've tried everything. And so when they go through the list of the things that they've tried, they say, well, yes, I tried magnesium. And then I tried the B6 or, and then I tried this and then I tried that. And so they've tried things individually that didn't work versus thinking the way you're putting it out there as because it is multifactorial having someone that can help you pull together a strategy to address all of those different pieces that might be working into it may actually be the trick to get to that relief yes. level yeah. yeah perfect i'm glad you emphasized that and almost never has someone when someone has said i've tried everything almost never have I found that to be true, uh, you know, because uh, I can always come up with something that I <laughs> thought was meaningful that they haven't tried. And then also, like you said, the multifactorial, more agents at one time. And then there's dosing, you know, yeah, they did this vitamin, but what dose were they using and how long did they try it for? Someone who's having yeah. uh, migraines, the prophylaxis plan that I want to put together is is a minimum a three month start. This is the plan for the next three months. 
I need two, three menstrual cycles, two, three ovulations, two, whatever, to, to, to see uh, what's going to happen. And we're talking about the prophylaxis plan. I also want them to have a good rescue acute plan, which might still need to be drugs, uh, whether that's over the counter or prescription, because uh, there's very few natural agents that have an immediate effect for acute migraines. Uh, yeah. Really, ginger is the only one that's really been studied as a pill. Then there's intravenous magnesium. The rest of it is prophylaxis. So how can we use our natural medicine, diet, lifestyle, stress management plan over the course of this I vote three month period of time, have the the rescue agents that have been working for them or find one that works better. And then over time we get to reduce their medications. That happens yeah. in most cases. That will that will happen in most cases, that they will be able to improve their migraine frequency and severity over time. It's nice to have that positive trajectory you know, out there for people. So for the listener, Dr. Hudson, that may not have access to somebody like you, could you maybe give us the, you know, three to five things in, in list of priority, priority that they might do if they're suffering from migraine and trying to figure out the cause, for example, should they start with a diet diary or, you know, what, what would those three to five things be that the listener could start tomorrow to try to figure yeah. out what's going on? Yeah, well, I would say if not the diet diary and, and when the headaches are, um, at least inquire, do you notice, you know, a cause and effect relationship that yourself um, by when you drink alcohol or when you eat cheese or when you eat a certain food? Um, and so that's kind of like the first cherry to pick is something that they really notice and then the, the secondly you could do i suppose a month-long diet diary and that surely i did a lot of that early in my career it just seemed to be a more tedious thing <laughs> to ask people to do and maybe you all are more patient than than i uh uh and so i kind of have gotten away from that but it is i think kind of a good old school old-fashioned kind of strategy um, and then I mentioned testing. I, I don't know if your audience can do some of these food sensitivity testing with IgG. That's sort of what we're trying to pick up is not I eat strawberries and I get a headache because that's the easy ones we should be able to find out just by a Q&A. But we're looking for more of those delayed hypersensitivity reactions, something that you ate in the last four days. We don't know which food when, but but if we did this IgG testing um of there's tests i usually t do a test that's about 96 foods um and igg testing and it's a little finger stick and and they give me back a report and they rate the foods you know no reaction mild medium severe very severe and so then uh, we decide which ones can they avoid and hopefully they're going to avoid at least the ones that are a category three, four, or five. Those are the worst ones. But again, you have to ask someone to avoid that food for three months. And people's beloved foods can be on those those tests. In terms of, you know, there's always the gluten wheat crowd. Um, and you could certainly do a trial and error with that um, without testing and just see as a sort of a global idea and you might you know, you'll catch a few people there um but the food sensitivity test is the best way i know how to get sort of more some attempt at objective information for these hypersensitivity reactions um, I'm, I'm curious yeah. before you leave that and go to the next thing in terms of migraine triggers which we touched on a little bit and we are yeah. again here what's the time frame like when somebody would kind of relate something as a trigger, like I drank a glass of wine two nights ago and I got a migraine a couple of days later, or is it usually within 12 hours or is there any kind of a time frame there? That's a great question. I don't know that I scientifically know the proper answer to that, but, uh, and I think it varies incredibly by medic, by individual, uh, but alcohol is in my experience is usually pretty quick uh, within, mm -hmm. you know, a few hours. 
Um, oh. And um, too much, I mean, caffeine can be a medicine, but also, and some people are using caffeine as a prophylaxis, but then you can run into troubles with these rebound headaches uh, okay. with caffeine. So, but food wise that, uh, that, uh, that are these delayed hypersensitivity reactions. Yeah. I would say more, you know, four hours up to four days, um, okay. is kind of what I would be looking for. Not immediately, okay. not in the first 30 to 60 minutes that, that is, uh, not a delayed hypersensitivity. That's a true allergy, what I would call yeah. it. Right. Okay. And so, okay, I'll let you get back to other <laughs> things that we can do. I'm sorry, I kind of derailed us there. But so well, we do you want to? Uh, yeah, do you want to talk about some other of the supplements or herbs? Sure, Is whatever. Like we were like kind of talking about things that people might be able to do on their own before they go see a. Okay. A practitioner. So if there's anything else that's on your mind about that, otherwise we can. Move well, I suppose it. people can try. I mean, people can try these supplements on their own. They might not be in the best position to triage what might make the most sense. So I always like to look for what I call two furs and three furs. Like if you have migraines and I have some depression uh, and have sleep problems, you know, 5-hydroxytryptophan is going to kind of stand out for me uh, because that's a, it affects serotonin. We know it's, it's on the list of migraine prophylaxis because it, mm -hmm. its effect on serotonin levels. It, is, it can be a mild antidepressant and can be a mild sleep aid. So that's what I mean by a twofer or a threefer. Um, the, uh, whether that's 5-hydroxytryptophan or L-tryptophan. Magnesium might be another one to look for. She gets a little, she's a little, kind of runs a little higher stress, maybe has a little trouble mailing it out before sleep. Uh, that is a mi good migraine prophylaxis, has a little bit of research, 600 milligrams a day, and about a 42% reduction in the uh, frequency of my, the number of days that they had migraines. So do I- you I don't want to interrupt. I'm going, I'm going to interrupt. interrupt yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to do no, it. No Sorry. <laughs> um, so with then, the magnesium, I, I kind of wanted to ask you this because yeah. I see some people having some really good results with the magnesium L3 and 8 form versus like a glycinate. And I was wondering if you had any I don't, I have no to reason that. to think that one, I have no reason to think that one of those is better than the other for migraine okay. prophylaxis. Okay. Good to know. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's a couple research studies on oral magnesium. One was 250 milligrams twice a day. One was 600. So five, 600. Uh, but I would try it for three months, not as a solo agent. I would be thinking because uh, it's really mostly affecting uh, magnesium is affecting well serotonin a little bit. But the uh, the the trip the, the serotonin. Did I just say that? Serotonin a little bit. And um, what other pathway? Uh, well, it does I, affect histamine processing too. Okay, histamine, good. Um, but I'm now I got to think, okay, what about the inflammatory cascade? What about vasoactive substances? Um, so I got to think about what else I want to have in that plan. But so... The, the whole list is going to, for me, prophylaxis that has research support would be magnesium, 5-HTP, L-tryptophan, B6, riboflavin, uh, folic acid even, um, CoQ10, and butterbur, melatonin, uh, and yeah, maybe fish oils, um, fever few. Did I mention that one? Um, that is sort of the whole list of things that I'm going to be choosing from and putting together uh, some kind of combination. Now, if somebody were going to experiment with some of those on their own, but they also are maybe on like an antidepressant or something like that, are there some of those things that they might need to avoid? 
Well, like the they're all key. everybody. Everybody does get kind of hot and bothered about an SSRI and a 5-HTP or an L-tryptophan and serotonin syndrome. But the tra- fact of the matter that is a very rare phenomenon. Even when you do two SSRIs, or even when you do a very high dose of an SSRI. So one average dose SSRI and a one uh, serotonin enacting natural agent. I don't think I've ever seen serotonin syndrome, but one could be super cautious and decide not to do that. Um, but if that, that's really the only one that I can think of it at the moment. Okay. Um, and so something like melatonin, I mean, there are people, things that sometimes people have side effects from or paradoxical reactions to and melatonin seems to be one of those things Um, but there was a decent study in melatonin three milligrams a day as prophylaxis compared to a common prophylaxis drug called amitriptyline and basically it was as effective the melatonin Mm -hmm. three milligrams a day before but was as effective as the amitriptyline prophylaxis and um and again, for three week, three months, you really need to see that. Um, Butterbur is another one that has some some research. Um, the thing to look out for Butterbur is you want a, a product that has been is free of the pyridazoline alkaloids or PAs because that can have some hepatotoxicity. But if the product is PA free, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and the dosing there, I think uh, I think they had two different doses, um, and one dose maybe worked a little bit better than the others. I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, 75 milligrams, 50 milligrams twice a day, or 75 milligrams twice a day, the higher dose seems to work better. Um, if you were just using that as a single agent, you could use a lower dose in combination with the melatonin and the riboflavin etc the the only acute oral nutraceutical botanical that i'm aware of in terms of the research is ginger and there was one study on ginger uh and comparing it to sumatriptan i think it was a low dose of sumatriptan which is a medication for acute migraines but um the um the ginger, what was the dose? I'm trying to find it here. Um, the ginger, again, worked as well as the sumatriptan for an acute migraine. 50 milligrams of sumatriptan versus a ginger capsule, 250 milligrams at the onset of the headache. And that's mm-hmm. important in general, no matter if it's the ginger or acupuncture or IV magnesium or an over-the-counter this or that, or a prescription this or that, trying to get it at the onset in that first phase of the migraine before you get into phase two of the migraine cascade of things happening across the brain, the much better results one will get with acute relief. That's good to know. Well, I I know we're coming up on time, which is hard to believe because I'm sure, Kristen, you have 10 more questions like I do. (laughs) Um, But I feel like this has been a masterclass, Dr. Dr. Hudson. So thank you so much. I think we've covered a lot in in a short period of time. But I know just real quick, um, you're you're a living legend. We talked about that at the (laughs) beginning in Kristen's intro. So I'm sure that the listeners as curious as we are. Tell us how you've incorporated the things that you've learned over your 39-year career into your life. So what's a day in the life of Dr. Hudson look like? <laughs> well, I have learned to say that, you know, this career, natural naturopathic medicine and being a naturopathic physician, is it's really a life. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a career. And that's one of the things I love so much about it and feel so privileged Uh, And I think it's unique that the career and the 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 work is so uh, integrated into my life anyway, and it can be, I think, any practitioner's life. And I think that's true of being a nutritionist as well uh, in in some similar ways. Um, A day in the life. Uh, (laughs) 
Well, I, I, I started early on with experimenting with diets and I was, you know, I mean, in high school, a vegetarian, then I kind of went the way of being a fruitarian, you know, that was dramatic. And that was my, <laughs> that was my, I don't know what years that was in the seventies. Uh, and, uh, so I was a fruitarian and then I gradually added kind of one meager change at a time, but over the course of 10 years was a vegan. And, and now I'm, you know, I'm much more of an omnivore, but so I've evolved my whole, my, my nutrition, which for me, I think correlates with just evolving into a kind of philosophy of, of open-mindedness and flexibility and individualization and there is not a one size fits all but the the art and the science of the medicine is like what is right for this person you know in yeah. this moment in this scenario in their capabilities their capacity um that, that's been a very important concept to me but i <clears throat> The day in the life, I'm still, I'm 71. I still have a practice. I still work full time. I'm uh, raising a, a, a boy who is now 15, um, who I acquired when I was 65. <laughs> and uh, that's been a, a surprise bonus uh, that I never really saw coming. Um, but And I live in the country. I live on many acres and get to be you know, amongst the trees, which I, I really talk to people about trees a lot these days. And, um, and I have a, or I grow food. Uh, I chop my own firewood. I, uh, but I like television and, you know, popcorn. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> my, 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 my vice is, is television. I'm, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a, a very fortunate person, uh, but I, you know, I think it's a combination of, of for people to ha have a good life is to be educated and well informed. Um, and certainly there's luck involved, there's privilege involved, and there's making the most of the opportunities that, that kind of come your way. And, and there's people, the influencers in our life and recognizing those people, right? And, yeah. and recognizing, what, wow, I, I, what you want to learn from them and what you want to take in and what you want to discard and uh, all that just evolves over time. And I really believe in the, the spectrum of like, it takes a whole, like holistic medicine to me is really having to embrace the concept of the whole that means the you might say the good and the bad or the strong and the weak or the the more aggressive treatments and the less aggressive treatments and the you know the the uh, the the toxicity and the purity i mean you know i think it's really like how can i live best amongst my surroundings environmentally people nature food air and how how can i how can we adapt and how can we be uh make the best choices possible and that requires information and, and education yeah and i think you know the take-home message that you just gave me is giving ourselves the grace to evolve because our health is a journey and we're, you know, we're never done and just allowing ourselves to continue on that path. So thank you. Yeah. And thank you for sharing all of that with us. Yeah. Evolution is a, uh, the concept of evolving is a incredible, <laughs> you know, an incredible thing to really embrace. And uh, so thank you for noting, noting that. Yeah. Well, you well, thank are, you, you guys, for the opportunity. Oh. You guys are swell and <laughs> vibrant and lively, and I'm glad to meet you, and hopefully our paths will cross again. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. You are lovely and bright and generous, and I hope that the listeners will share this episode with anybody that they know, especially their women, 
friends and family members that are suffering with migraines. So thank you again, Dr. Hudson. It was an absolute pleasure. Oh, and sweet. Yeah, and thank you everybody for listening. We can't wait to see you next time. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. This episode of the Nourishing You podcast is brought to you by NANP Platinum sponsor, Holistic Consulting. Holistic Consulting is a 12-month cohort-based online program for those working towards becoming board certified through the NANP or those seeking continued nutrition education and guidance on starting a business. The program consists of 12 modules, each having a specific nutrition and business development focus. For more information, go to holisticconsultinghq.com. If you'd like to access other episodes or subscribe so you don't miss a beat, you can find us at nanp.org forward slash nanp dash podcast. Membership in the NAMP provides you with a competitive advantage. Whether you're a current practitioner or a student, we want you to become an active, informed leader of the holistic nutrition community and join today at NAMP.org. NAMP is very proud to provide the highest level of professional recognition and validation in the holistic nutrition industry through the board certification and holistic nutrition credential. To earn this valuable designation, candidates must demonstrate an exceptional level of knowledge and understanding of holistic nutrition by passing a board exam and documenting client contact hours. Are you ready to boost your credibility with board certification? Visit NAMP.org today to apply. Keep in mind that the information on the NANP podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical or legal advice. The NANP is not liable or responsible for any harm, damage, or illness arising from the use of the information contained herein. By listening to the information on this podcast, you agree to defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the NANP and all agents. Copyright NANP, all rights reserved.